Hello and welcome to Tao Capes. I'm Cody Nestor. He's Todd Hill. What's up, guys? Today we're discussing Marvel's Blood Hunt number one. The skies have gone dark, the sun hiding its face from the carnage to come. The children of the night, the vampires, have risen from the dark and hidden places of the world as one to drown the Marvel Universe in blood. Earth's final night has fallen. Can even the heroes of this doom world stem the tide of blood that is to come? Join the Avengers, Blade, Bloodline, Spider-Man, Hunter's Moon, Tigra, Doctor Strange, and Clea as the dance of death begins in Blood Hunt number one. Written by Jed McKay with art by Pepe Larraz. Todd, let's discuss Blood Hunt number one. Okay. Spoilers are ahead. So, Todd, here we are. We're back again as two men who do not read modern comics on the regular anymore back in the game for quite a number of years and we're jumping head first into a marvel event comic event at that comic. <laughs> yeah we're not getting back in by reading spider-man or an x-men <laughs> book we're jumping right back in with an event comic uh so high level what's, what's your thoughts uh well i mean typically you know with an event comic you're gonna have deaths uh, apparently we get that right off the bat here Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. And you're going to have tie-ins. You're going to have tie-ins at the yin-yang. So I think the actual event is, what, five issues? Five or six, but yeah. tie-ins galore, baby. <laughs> yeah, we were just talking about that before. It's something I I kind of, in kind of after reading this and just doing a little research about it, because, like, I wanted to see how many issues I saw, you know, some other YouTube videos pop up of, like, you know, Blood Hunt is X number of issues, like I think 40-some, you know, yeah. all told, tie-in. We were looking at the the road to Blood Hunt before we started the podcast, and you said that's, what, 16, 17? I think it was like 17, 18 issues, yeah. And now you've read them all, correct? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, as far as tie-ins go, I mean, that's, I'm sure we'll mention it, uh, you know, kind of as we get to the review part of this, but, uh, you know, we're, we're not reading any tie-ins for this. We're just straight into the big event comic book. Yeah. Main mainline issue, main series, that's yeah. it. Whatever context we get from that is all we're going to have. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> if you want more context than that, I do have a few notes about some of the uh, the villains that pop up. But other than that, if you're looking for context for these other tie-ins, ain't going to happen. <laughs> not paying Marvel any kind of money for all that, uh, all those tie-ins. You're right. Not paying to read, I don't know, what, X-Factor? I don't know. <laughs> There's no. T I don't it remember. runs through everything. I'm sure it runs through absolutely everything. I mean, I'm a blood hunt Hulk or something. <laughs> you know, I'm pretty sure there's that. So, anyway, so let's go through uh, the the book itself. Let's kind of go through the story, Todd. I'll, I'll kick us off here. So we kick things off. We got a countdown to sun death. It says uh, in the, in the city we see Scarlet Witch. She's uh, watching Blackout, who she says was robbing a bank, and all of a sudden he just explodes. Uh, Iron Man uh, says he has reports from all over the world about other superhumans exploding. He mentions Dark Star, Dusk, Silhouette, and Cloak, all Dark Force users. I don't know any of those. Uh, I remember Cloak if it's the same Cloak from Cloak and Dagger, but that's about it. Sure, we'll <laughs> say it is. Uh, we got Scarlet Witch. She remarks that they've become portals to the Dark Dimension. And Iron Man remarks, with all the Dark Force in the air, we've lost the sun. Not good. That's when we see the vampires attack. This is an event book, Todd, and our, our main protagonists here are going to be vampires. Tons that's, of them. Tons of them. That's kind of what piqued my interest about this. It sounded a little bit different from what we've gotten from uh, event comics before yeah uh so the vampires attack but let's go ahead and uh, let's talk about our key players here so as we go through obviously the avengers are going to be key players you have scarlet witch iron man thor captain marvel black panther vision captain america the hat we have something called the midnight mission not familiar with them me either hunter's moon and tigra and then we have also joining this book is going to be Spider-Man, Miles Morales, Spider-Man, okay. Blade, Doctor Strange, Clea, and Doctor Doom. What do you think about the the, the key players here, Todd? Uh, I mean, pretty solid cast, I would say. The only one I don't really have any familiarity with would be Hunter's Moon. I'm not quite sure who that, that is. but Yeah, I don't really have any exposure to Hunter's Moon or, or Tigra, I guess. Unless it's the Thundercats Tigra. Right. That's, <laughs> right. And I don't think it is, Todd. No, no. Uh, back to the story. So we see vampires kind of attacking all over the world. 
Uh, including in Doomstat, Latveria. Oh, yeah. Yeah, apparently Doomstat has an impenetrable, invisible force field to keep out its non-citizens. People getting incinerated on contact here. <laughs> uh, on a rooftop in Brooklyn, Blade finds Miles Morales and tells him he has something he needs Miles to do. We don't get any more information than that about what he uh, tasked Miles with. We get a few pages of the Avengers fighting vampires and wondering if Dracula could be behind this. Apparently, Dracula has his own vampire nation, according to uh, Sam Wilson, Captain America, and it's outside of Dracula's trajectory right now, he says. So, apparently, Dracula, in context, in, in continuity. Uh, alive, here. Well, oh, alive or, or undead and well. Undead and well, in, yeah. in the Marvel Universe. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, we go back to Blade. What's happening with uh, with Blade here, Todd? So, he's uh, driving, looks like an armored truck or some kind of big uh, tanker-type truck, and he's trying to get uh, coordinates and be beamed up to the Impossible City. Yeah, he tells the Avengers to teleport him and his rig to the Impossible City. So, this was something new to me that I'd never seen before. Not when familiar we, with that city either. We've huh? seen, you know, helicarriers and all types of stuff. But apparently, so I, I did a little research on this. So, the Impossible City, so the Avengers, it's one of the Avengers' new team members apparently. The Impossible City is a sentient metropolis which is set to serve as their new headquarters and the city volunteered to join the team after being freed from the Ashen Combine. I guess in another kind of Jed McKay Avengers run he okay. did recently. So it's a sentient city, Chad. That's the best I can tell you. It's guy. a living, breathing it's, city. It's, okay. and it's, it's an actual member. Okay. Yes. Of the Avengers. Yeah, of right. the Avengers, yes. Okay. Uh, Iron Man calls all the Avengers home to meet with Blade, but uh-oh, Todd, turns out it was a trap as we're introduced to the Blood Coven. All right, so let, let's kind of go through these here. So uh, I think... I don't know if these characters have been around before. I don't think they have been. I think I read they were introduced for this series. Yeah. yeah. So the, the 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 Blood Coven are a mysterious and deadly vampire faction consisting of uh, Megrum, Megrum, Megrim. <laughs> Why are you sad? I know, right? <laughs> Megrimlock. Uh, cruel, unusual, the Damascene, Smoke Eater, and their leader, Bloodstorm One, a clone of Dracula created by Hydra. The group's motives, powers, and abilities will strike unfathomable fear into the, in your hearts of your favorite heroes, and their bloodlust is only matched by their extreme brutality and undying commitment to a dark master. Nice. Straight, straight from Marvel.com, baby. That's what it <laughs> says. Um, so uh, I did kind of read, they put out some information like after the issue come out. So uh, the, the artist here, Pepe, he shed some light on his design inspiration for each member of the Shadowy Faction, and I just thought it was kind of interesting. So we'll start with the one called Cruel. So this one is pretty straightforward. A character wrapped in razor wire by his own wheel is terrifying enough. So that's what I did. I added the cloud of wires at his feet and neck, always moving like some kind of metal gorgon. So cruel. He's our uh, he's our one covered in barbed wire. Smoke eater. The idea is that he inhales ghosts to acquire their strength in combat. So I made a physical representation of that. He becomes the unification of multiple beings, therefore the multiple limbs, which makes him uh, his silhouette pretty recognizable in battle scenes and makes him one of the heavy hitters of the team. The idea is that he shows all the eyes of the ghosts on his forehead. I have a thing with eyes of my own designs. I either put none or too many. <laughs> that's, that's what Pepe said. Right. Uh, the Damascene. Uh, my initial idea was to make them bi-dimensional, like a paper sheet that will cut you when you try to grab it, but it's very difficult to convey that idea in comics without movement, so I did his body absolutely geometrical to remark uh, the sharpness of the body. Again, I decided to put no face. Expressionless beings are more scary, in my opinion. And then we have Megrum. Probably the most vampire-looking of the litter. I hit her face on red cloth, but my idea is that the cloth was always drenched in blood. The skirts, folds, make shapes like faces screaming of pain. Everything is super intense with her. She must be unbearable. Uh, unusual. The initial idea by Jed was to make him a collage of old engravings, always changing like some kind of sinister Max Ernst picture and movement, but that would present a copyright issue, so I came up with a weird idea. I started with a bunch of parallel lines and using a liquify tool from Clip Studio to make shapes with those lines, and finally adapted these shapes to a human silhouette. It's probably the weirdest and fastest design I've even done. Cool. And our last, uh, our last character here of the Blood Coven is Bloodstorm 1. 
So I gave him a lot of thought because I didn't want to do a vampire superhero, but a true monster who is scary enough that he's even scared of himself. He hides his true nature under a perfect human shell, like some kind of Michelangelo's David, which is uh, rotten inside, twisted, homicidal. The worst monster of all is the one who wants to look as the perfect human. The armor is homage to Vlad's armor from Coppola's Dracula film, which seemed to me like a proper reference. So what do you think of the blood coven here, Todd? I mean, overall, just uh, looking at me here right in this group shot, uh, overall, I like the designs of them. I think they're pretty cool looking, honestly. Yeah, I mean, obviously there's, uh, you know, kind of getting some background with the, the character designs here. Um, I think all of them are, are pretty unique. Obviously, we're going to see in just a moment that they're they're definitely a match for the Avengers. Oh, apparently, yeah. At least catching them off guard here. Uh, and I like some of the, you know, like I said, to put this in, I like some kind of the, the background information that you get about you know, some of the design choices here. But, I mean, overall, like, I do like the designs of them. Again, they're kind of introduced for this. And we do get hints throughout that uh, the Blood Coven itself is a – they're working for somebody. Yeah. They're working for a Dark Master. So right. our true villain of this is still yet to be revealed. Yep. Um, it's kind of like a Thanos situation. You know, he has his, like, uh, his minions that go out, you know, right, like Cold right. City and those kind of things. It's kind of a, a Thanos situation in that way. So yeah. there's still more mystery to, to come here. But pretty much from here, it's a fight. It's a big fight. It's yeah. a big fight. Uh, some highlights I remarked. I don't know if you have any. Some highlights are Thor being surprised after uh, Damascene is able to kind of cut him. Yeah, draws blood on Thor. Mm-hmm. Bloodstorm 1 says the Damascene can cut anything, be it Asgardian flesh or intangible synthroid molecules as he throws a blade through vision, taking him out as well. Iron Man, he's kind of wrapped in uh, barbed wire inside and outside of his suit by Cruel, so yeah. he's kind of taken out of the game. Captain Marvel, she gets taken down by a tag team of Megram, who attacks her mind, and Smoke Eater, who attacks her body. Bloodstorm and Cap kind of have a face-off. Bloodstorm remarks to Cap that he particularly wants him as a prize for their master when he turns him. Uh, he says, you will be our symbol and your species will weep. I like the idea that they want to specifically turn Captain America. Like, if you kind of show that symbol to the, yeah. the people of the world, especially in America, of course. Right. Like, to, to kind of zap their will away from him and turn him, a, to, turn him into a symbol of evil here. And uh, one by one, the Avengers kind of fall. Thor's taken out in a particularly brutal way. He's kind of spiked in the head. And uh, Damascene makes it kind of clear that it's not to kill him. But, I mean, like, I know he's an Asgardian, Todd. I know he's pretty tough. But, I mean, he's got, like, three spikes in his body. Yeah. And he gets spiked right in the right head. Right through the dome, yeah. So I, we're still taking to believe he's still alive in some form or fashion because it doesn't make a big deal out of it, really. Right. It's not like everybody's like, oh, my God, he's dead. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, like, I'm assuming he's still going to be alive. Still, I don't still don't think we have a major death yet. Uh, Black Panther kind of tells the city prepared to dimension shift and the city is unable to due to the pain it feels from Cruel's barbed wire. Apparently, uh, since it's a sentient city, he's kind of rubbing, rubbing, running his barbed wire. I'm rubbing my barbed wire. <laughs> Don't do that. Oh, yeah. You get cut, son. <laughs> he's running his barbed wire all through the city uh, and also kind of hurting the city as well. So instead, T'Challa tells the city to emergency evac and to start with Cap. And the rest of the Avengers are evacuated as T'Challa is impaled by Bloodstorm 1's fist. And again, I still question, is this a, is this a real true death? Is he really dead yeah or are we just like shock value in it that's the thing about this one of the problems i had with this book is like are we just are we just severely injuring the avengers or are we killing off people i think right to me i think we're just severely injuring again it doesn't feel like a real like impactful death it doesn't feel like yeah. it's spotlighted enough to it's be all right. happening so quickly so fast and it's not made a big deal of which means to yeah. believe it's not a big deal right you know what right. i mean uh, what's going on on Bleecker Street? Take us through that. We're pretty much towards the end of the book now, so take us through what's going down on Bleecker Street when uh, Blade pays a visit to Doctor Strange. And so we come clear. back. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't interrupt me, boy. <laughs> God damn. I'm sorry, just kidding. <laughs> go ahead. And go. Okay. <laughs> so we're back on uh, old Bleecker Street, and we see uh, Doctor Strange and his uh, lady love, Clea. They're mm -hmm. kind of going through some uh, mystic tomes. Are they looking for a certain spell? I can't recall. Montessi formula. Right. Yeah. Which is supposed to wipe out all vampires. And by now, Blade has showed up and he's like, well, you know, some of those are, you know, uh, hero, heroic vampires. You're going to wipe all them out too? And, and Strange is like, hey, I'm a doctor. If I got to cut off a limb to save a life, I'll cut off that limb every time. 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, he kind of gives some kind of. A, this is kind of the the part of the book where we get some some definite exposition. There's a there's a panel here where he says they call themselves the structure, a vampire cult that was spreading across the world before Moon Knight killed their leader. But they found a new leader, one with a plan. A little note here to see that in Moon Knight eighteen, Todd. If yeah. You, if you're so inclined to pick that up as well. Uh, more exposition here. One using antediluvian Atlantean rituals to detonate Dark Force users and turn them into portals to block out the sun. Uh, the second part of the plan, global uprisings, mobilizing legions of mass-turned maniacs all across the globe, striking at population centers, critical infrastructure, the like. And three, taking out the Avengers. So they've put three stages of their plan into, into action so far. You kind of see here that Strange and Clear are like, ah, oh, you, you crazy. You crazy. That ain't, you crazy. That ain't happening. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he tells them that a kill squad was sent for the Avengers, ultra vampires fed on superhuman blood, empowered by divergent philosophies of feeding on pain or ghosts or magic. The Blood Coven is a match for the Avengers, believe me. And then I think Blade, on the next page here on our next panel, he says... Or was a match, I guess. This isn't conjecture. The Avengers are down, Todd. Avengers yes. down. Down for the count. Take us through the last little bit here. So, uh, you know, they're kind of having a little bit of a back and forth. And, you know, this is where, you know, we it, we kind of get the dialogue with Strange. It's like, you know, I want to, we're going to go ahead and go forward with this spell. We're going to cast it and kill all these vampires. And that's when Blade kind of says, every vampire, you realize some of them are on, on your side, don't you? And he's like, you know, I'm a doctor. If I got to cut away a limb to save the patient. I'll do it every time. And uh, Blade kind of is like, you know, impressive, you know, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And then we kind of find out at the end that there is a, is a leader of this new pact, and it is, in fact, Blade. Blade, our last panel after he tells us, you're strange, do you want to know who blocked out the sun? Do you want to know who yeah. it is? It's me, apparently. And as we see uh, mm-hmm. on our last panel here, we see uh, Dr. Stephen Strange getting uh, impaled behind from uh, Blade's sword. Yep. So, yeah. Uh, a little twist ending here. Something that you didn't see coming. Is this really? Is this really Blade? Is this someone else pretending to be Blade? Right. Uh, another major villain or our big bad that hasn't been revealed. You know, kind of. I would. That's my guess. I assume this really isn't Blade. I assume this is not the real Blade. Kind of got a feeling this ain't Blade. Yeah. Either he's <laughs> either he's being um, manipulated somehow into this, or we've got somebody maybe pretending to be Blade. Uh, again, the dark corners of the marvel universe i'm not as familiar with right so like any do you have any guesses of who the big bad might be did you look up anything uh right now i I couldn't give you a clue yeah i don't uh there's nothing that stands out to me uh, specifically about who the big bad could be you know i mean the ballsy twist is it is the real blade which would be kind of cool but then what are you gonna do from there yeah like are you really gonna turn blade bad which maybe but i feel like somebody's either puppeting or we just we got a doppelganger of some sort maybe a vampire shapeshifter or something like that that can uh take on the form of somebody and then you got to say, like, you know, six months to a year from now, is any of this stuff still going to be canon or matter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that let's come around to the real world stuff here. Yeah, like I'm just I'm, I'm kind of looking at the book here um, on my laptop as well, and I'm just looking. I'm just I'm scrolling, scrolling, scrolling down the list of these titles. Like it's literally touching everything. Not only do you have the road to Blood Hunt, you have – the Blood Hunt series itself. There's also a red band version of this book that we should mention. I didn't, I didn't, we read just the regular version of yeah. it. We didn't read the red band, especially apparently from what I've, from what I understand, it's slightly more violent, I guess. It looked like some of the panels where some of the Avengers get, you know, injured the most, like Thor's spiked head and T'Challa's like, in, you know, being impaled. I think it's like kind of darkened in those panels. I'm assuming like if you pay a little extra for that red band, we'll, see bright, we'll brighten that up <laughs> for you. We'll bring up a con- Contrast and brightness on that for you, <laughs> right? You, you give us a little bit more than Ducats, you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, but yeah, that's that's my big problem here is like, I think I guess there's enough context. I mean, you kind of are just thrown into it with little setup, but like, there's enough context so far for the story that I don't think it's like, you know, other than the whole backstory of like the structure and then having to read Mood Night eighteen. There's not a lot it's depending on me to, like, know prior so far because we're getting, like, 
characters that we kind of we already know, except for like a few, like Hunter's Moon and those people. And I can, you know, you can kind of look up your own stuff. And yeah. Get, get familiar enough with like, all right, who's Hunter's Moon? Google, tell me who that is. Yeah. But like, I think it's. We'll see if that holds true for the rest of the the issues here. Like when I come back from number two, is it going to say like, you know, oh, like remember when this happened? In Spinning the- out of the events yeah. of <laughs> yeah, Amazing Spider Man <laughs> Blood Hunt number six. Yes, like you know exactly, <laughs> and that's like that's the like what other industry get, gets away with this shit? Like whoever <laughs> whoever come up with the first like event comic that like had these many tie ins, I just wish I could find them and kick them in the ball. <laughs> <laughs> what other what other like medium or what other like thing in culture like it's, this would be like watching a film right and then be like you know having to depend on did you watch these like 17 other movies to <laughs> understand the context of what we're trying to convey yeah. here it's like oh you want to watch this like blade movie like this big blade event movie well you need to watch like 30 other films and i guess technically you could kind of say the mcu is like that but yeah. A little, but it's yeah. like it, it it still doesn't to this to this level, like, you know, just all these tie ins and everything. You've got forty, fifty books here and like I just that I just I hate the the idea of modern event comics. Yeah. But like, you know, this one intrigued me enough to kind of see what it was all about and like, you know, the premise of it is kind of what got you know, got me invested in it. So like and I, I didn't. I enjoyed the the first book for. We'll, we'll talk about reviews in, in a minute. But like you know, this idea of these modern like crossover event comics, like I don't understand. Like I don't understand the necessity. Well, I, I get it. It's about money. It's money. It's about I, money. Yeah, I always saw it as a way that they were trying to get you to read other titles they're producing or yeah. putting out. Hey, we're going to have this main event, but I want you to go read Moon Knight. And I want you to read uh, this little blade two two issue thing here, and, and read. hopefully you yeah. stick with. And it. And if you like it, you're going to stick with it, and our sales are going to go up and up and up and up. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, but even the idea of that too is like, I, I completely agree with you. But it's like, okay, we want you to read Moon Knight, but then it's it's Moon Knight specifically for a few weeks or a couple months tied to this Blood Hunt story. Yeah. So like, whatever it's been doing that may have made it good or bad is no longer what it's doing it, yeah that's it's a also good point. Yeah. sucked into this mm-hmm. so like maybe it had an awesome writer and artist but now they're being forced to that's another like part of it i think creatively that i would have to hate if i was in the industry like if i was a writer an artist like where i if i had been working on the book and i have to like put my plans off to like you yeah. know show some fucking vampires for <laughs> four months or right. whatever you know what i mean editorial comes in we're going to put that on hold yeah we're going with a vampire this awesome run you guys are doing on this book and like we're starting to catch momentum right now start to sell more copies like yeah. put that on the back burner boys we got a we got a crossover event we got a milk for all it's worth you like, can you draw vampires because <laughs> uh, you're gonna need to draw vampires Todd. you know what i mean but yeah it's just like that idea of like too like even picking up these other books, it may not be representative of what I'm going to get yeah. anyway. I mean, artists and everything change, but like, still, like, lead me to the book in another way, yeah. or just just paint your story and tell your story through a smaller collective narrative somewhere, yeah. and just say like, if you if you told me there's ten books that are going to matter, and like, you know what I mean? <laughs> Do I care about Hulk fighting? But you know, some vampires somewhere, probably not. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, I don't know. Anyway, they we're, we're probably soapboxing a little bit too much here. Yeah, and in my experience, you know, reading event comics in the past, now I don't know if things have changed currently, but it used to be nothing major was going to happen in the tie ins. If it was major to the story, it happened in the main yeah, story. Yeah, that's a good point, too. Yeah. Like, yeah, it, if you're going to see anything mostly. Like, it's going to be in the main book. If some, yeah. if a main hero is going to die or whatever, like, you know, like Civil War all that, it's not like Cap died in, like, you know, Astonishing X Me in number 14. Right, or, right. You know, Cap got shot or whatever, yeah. or, like, Iron Man, whoever, you know, like, whatever, you know, whatever I'm saying there. Like, um, I don't know what I'm saying there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, your major, like, deaths and your major progression of the story is all, all going to happen in the main title to drive sales to it. So, like, they already kind of puts in a preconceived notion that this is more a waste yeah. of my time. It's a character I'm not really interested in or a book I don't really normally buy. And you're just trying to like force me to like, you know, to just like take the medicine 
And uh, but you know, whatever. Well, like, yeah, it is what it is. It is what it is. Like at this point, it's never going to change. Like you know, w- then that's that's the you know that's why there's a lot of uh, different comic companies now. There's like why indies are doing a lot better than they used to. And, True. You know, the big two are the big two, but you have other stuff out there that's like that doing some fantastic work. And you know, hopefully we'll get into some more indie stuff one day. But you know, there's, you know, Image and all these other companies out there doing some really good stuff that's not money and event driven as much as this yeah. kind of stuff is. And I oh, mean, yeah. I, yeah. I guess in a way too, it could be argued that it's a way to keep people interested in modern superhero comics is having these big events every it's every year there's always yeah. something and that's another problem too it's like oversaturation i think it's like every year they do something like this yeah you know there's going to be a big event you know like it's going to cross over with you know every freaking title that's that's there but anyway we're too we're too in the weeds <laughs> about this time we're too in, and i don't want this to like you know before we get into reviews i don't want people to like think that are listening to this or watching and be like well obviously they they hate it because it's a big event book i got i'm not letting that prejudice my enjoyment of this book because again we're just looking at this book Mm -hmm. and if we continue reading this it's just gonna be whatever blood Blood hunt hunt one one to five no yeah no (laughs) tie-ins nothing like that so yeah uh, ready to move on to uh, review? Let's do it. Re- All right, Todd. So give us your final thoughts and review score for Blood Hunt number one. You know, damn it, Marvel, you had me at hordes of vampires, i tell you what. <laughs> right. But, you know, I- I'm liking the premise. Uh, I actually like this first issue. Uh, I kind of went back and forth on the score, but I think I'm going to settle with a six, which is decent. Uh, you know, uh, as far as first issues go, like I said, we only got five in the main storyline. So you kind of had to, you mm-hmm. got to have a pretty good pace. And, you know, like seeing Dr. Strange get impaled at the end, Thor get impaled in the head. Are they alive? Are they dead? You know, I kind of want to see where this goes. If you, you've hooked me and if you hooked me, I'm usually along for the ride. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Something before I go to my review, something we didn't really specifically talk about. What did you think about the art here? I thought the art was pretty good, actually. I, I enjoyed the art. Yeah, I think it's I think it's uh, definitely serviceable to the story. Like, I don't know. I feel like I get very, like, art snubby sometimes when right. it comes to books. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't feel like, I don't feel like this artwork, and, you know, uh, again, I'm not really familiar with this artist because we don't, we're really mostly out of the comic game True. except for some of the stuff we reviewed here lately. But, like, uh, I don't feel like it was a, uh, uh, it was... It was in. It was complete. Like it wasn't detrimental. Right. Like I don't feel like it was like it didn't increase my enjoyment level because I'm like, oh my god, the art's so good. Like I just, it was serviceable. Yeah. Like it was just fine for this story. It's pretty safe. It has a style that kind of lends itself to being in a more of a kind of a, a dark Marvel, dark corners of the yeah. Marvel universe kind of vibe. Right. It does lend itself to that a little bit, but it wasn't like. I don't add a point or take away points for the art here. Like yeah. if you if you if you give me like some stuff that really you know kind of went to my eye a little bit more, right? You know maybe that would have boosted it, but there there was no detraction there. But the art style at all, I think it was I think it was fine. I think it was serviceable for for what we're getting here. I'm right there with you as far as overall score. I'm going to give it a six as well, which ranks it as decent. Uh, like I like you said, you've you've got me hooked with this one issue. I I bought into the premise before even reading the book. You know. Big vampire event, oh, bringing yeah. in some characters that I I haven't really read a lot of individual comic books of, like Blade and some of these other dark corners with the Marvel Universe kind of people. And you're also kind of tying into the Avengers, which, you know, how much they factor in from this point, who knows? They're kind of teleported and scattered a little bit right now. But you've got me with the premise. The art is kind of serviceable. Like, you've set up some stuff. You've got a little bit of mystery at the end with Blade. Where's that going to go? Is mm-hmm. this Blade? Is this a big Marvel Universe villain? that we've known and seen, or we introduced in a brand new big vad that might stick around in yeah. the Marvel canon for years. Not sure, but I think it was a decent issue and you've got me enough to uh, come back for issue two. I say so. Yeah. So, yeah. I think we'll be back here for an issue two and sometime next month and we'll keep and continue to check out Definitely. where this goes and then judge it issue to issue, I guess. Yeah. All right, Todd. So you want to tell everyone how they can find us and get in touch with us on social media? We're at Tau Capes on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Tau Capes Podcast on Facebook. You can also email us at TauCapesPod at gmail.com. Uh, if you enjoy the show, please consider leaving a like on the video and subscribing to the channel. If there's anything you guys want to suggest uh, for us to review comic book wise, let us know in the comments below. Tau Capes will return. We want to thank you so much for watching. Till next time. Bye, guys. See you, guys.